So for everybody who's maybe wondering, I know we have a little bit of a mysterious title uh, for today, but the main focus for today's talk is we're going to talk about the software development lifecycle and ways to implement security into it. Obviously, we're going to have to be a little bit vague with some of it, not uh, for uh, no reason other than there's just a lot of different frameworks for software development. We'll talk mostly about agile, but we will cover some of the other methods as well. But anybody who's ever had uh, to be part of a development team or project management at all likely understands that there can be a lot of fluidity to uh, the software development lifecycle. And at the end of it, we're going to share what is um, an interesting story, but also a cautionary tale as to why, one of the reasons why we're very uh, firm about why you should start building uh, your applications with security in mind. Um, oh, somebody posted a picture of everything on fire saying picture of my life. That is definitely, uh, I can't say for Kathy, but what my last couple of weeks I've felt like is that everything's on fire. <laughs> yes, everything is broken. Yes, everything has been broken for both of us. I even had a keyboard uh, go bad, like keys just started flying off of it. So I had to get a whole new keyboard. So without further ado, I'm gonna go ahead and introduce myself as soon as uh, the slides start working for me. So for those of you who maybe don't know me, I'm Jennifer Shannon. I'm one of the senior security consultants at Secure Ideas. I am, <laughs> uh, somebody said that Jennifer did have her driver go away. For those of you who are wondering, uh, since I, I'm, in Jacksonville, where Secure Ideas is headquartered out of. The city of Jacksonville did indeed steal my driveway one time. They just came out, tore up the entire bottom part of my driveway, never told me about it. I had no idea until I went to go to work and uh, there was no driveway. So I had to get uh, a rental car for a couple of weeks. So I started as a, uh, on the blue team, I was a SOC analyst where I, I ended up moving into a position where I was a threat intelligence analyst, where I reverse engineered malware and I did threat intelligence. But part of that job was also pen testing. I did a lot of our, the web app and API pen test for my previous company. And eventually I kind of decided that I wanted to go someplace else, do half of my job for the same amount of money, because uh, it was a little bit hard to juggle reverse engineering and pen testing. They're both very mentally intensive jobs. So, and I share that because I come from a background of deconstruction. A lot of people that I work with have a, they have a development background and I cannot develop anything very well at all. I am intimately familiar with the stages and the process and everything like that. I can't develop something. I am really good at reverse engineering things though. And that's kind of how I ended up where I am now. Uh, some other fun facts about me, all around geek. I don't know if anybody can notice, but I have a lot of Fallout memorabilia behind me. I collect uh, a bunch of memorabilia. I'm also a lockpick enthusiast. I run the Jacksonville Chapter of Tool, which is the organization of open locks. Uh, we meet on the second Friday of every month to learn, practice picking locks. And finally, my favorite game genre is survival horror. Uh, my two favorite games are, I love Silent Hill 2, and then the other one's Deadly Premonitions. And if anybody is not familiar with Deadly Premonitions, it's like Twin Peaks, the video game. So much fun. And I'll go ahead and hand it over to Kathy so she can introduce herself. Hello, um, I am Kathy Collins. I'm a security consultant with Secure Ideas, been there since here since 2021 uh, in the home office area with Jennifer in Jacksonville, Florida. Um, I have the uh, Sec Plus, I recently got my sis, um, and I come from a very different background. Uh, I was a chef for 20 years uh, prior to COVID and lost my job during COVID, went back to school uh, full time for six months and just really dug in and have completely changed careers. So in the last three years, um, since I started with Secure Ideas, I have come a long way. So um, as you can probably see by the, the CISP, like I barely qualified to even sit for that test, but I did. Um, so as Jennifer said, uh, we are both, wait, oh, keyboards. You mentioned keyboards. I don't have that on here, but we're both into keyboards. I've got, you can't see my office on the sides, but the walls are covered in keyboards, both into that. Um, this is my daughter here and my Corgi. Um, both turds. Um, she's about to be 13. I keep saying she's 13. If any of you have teenagers, like I feel like she's been 13 for two years, even though she won't be 13 until May. Um, I'm a horror fan. Uh, one of the 
Jacksonville B-Sides coordinators and a Costco member. That was just a weird thing I threw on there the other day. I was, I listened to this podcast, um, David Ferrier, it's called uh, uh, Flightless Bird. And he's from New Zealand. He does a bunch of stuff about like the weird things that as coming from New Zealand that Americans do. And he has this whole one about Costco and was interviewing people that just love Costco, a dollar fifty hot dog and a drink, and <laughs> then go buy an eight hundred dollar, you know, eighty six inch TV and you know all this stuff. So I was just like, God, I do love Costco. Yeah, I saw um, her slides last night and it cracked me up. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I've been focusing for the last few years on networking, web applications, and Jennifer and I are both. Uh, heavily interested in the physical pen testing. She's done much more of it than I have. I'm just starting to get into it. Um, done a little bit of the lock picking with her, a tool. Um, it's a, a fun area. Um, I, and one that we've already had many adventures. With. I do believe you stole a golf cart one time though, didn't you? Yes, that's right. I did. Yeah. And I think the police showed up and you were like, oh, this is a pen test. And they're like, okay, cool. Yeah, that was one of my first ones. So I was like, <laughs> just excited to be there. And then when the police showed up, I was like, I have a get out of jail free card. You can't do anything. And then <laughs> they were like, don't ever back away like that and try to because I was, I was going to run. I don't know what I was thinking. But <laughs> um, she was like, no, don't ever do that. Because that's when the hip comes out. And she patted her gun on her hip. <laughs> <laughs> and reality set it. And I was like, oh, yeah, this is real. Although, you know, when you're, when you're doing it for work and you have a get out of free card, it doesn't, uh, not as scary. Um, anyway, so that's me in a nutshell and Jennifer, we can. Yeah. I was going to say without further ado, go? we're going yeah. to dive into the software development life cycle or SDLC for short. Oh, good. I love it whenever I hit the next button, but I'd click somewhere else so it doesn't actually move over. So I've listed here, there are just a couple of different uh, methodologies for the software development lifecycle. There's the waterfall. They call this because each task is dependent on the task before it. Um, so each, it's just very linear. It's you do one, then you do the other. Uh, then there's the iterative that kind of breaks it down into smaller chunks to make it a little bit easier to manage. And it, it's kind of meant to, once you've developed out those small segments of the application, then you can improve on those and build those up. Uh, there's also the spiral. And I, I do want to say, I'm not happy with the picture for the spiral here, but it is the one I used because when I just let uh PowerPoint pick the little images that went with it, it decided to assign the waterfall to spiral and then the the image for spiral to waterfall and I still don't know why it did that but it cracks me up um because everything is broken this week. yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> um spiral is kind of a combination of that waterfall and iterative it's um gonna work on each thing is going to be dependent before the thing before it but it's all quote kind of broken up into those little bit of a smaller tasks and agile, which is probably the one that I think most people are going to be familiar with just because it's, it's very widely used for a lot of different reasons. Uh, it kind of adopts the incremental and iterative principles, which, uh, incrementals again, very similar to the, uh, iterative, but also slightly different. Um, the interesting thing, there's a couple of interesting things about uh, Agile is one, it, it has a manifesto, which I somehow consistently forget. I took a project management class in high school and they made us read the Agile manifesto and go to the website. I don't know if anybody's gone to look at the website. It is very office space looking for some reason. Um, the TPS reports. <laughs> so... Uh, not that there's anything inherently wrong with the uh, management style having a manifesto. It's just for some reason it feels, I don't know, I feel bad saying this, a little bit culty. Um, the word manifesto just kind of. Yeah, it, like, it inspires. Conjures that up. Right? Yeah. Um, we have a couple and more that aren't necessarily listed here. There's the uh, the lean methodology. And the idea behind that is it's to trim out the fat. Essentially, if it's not something that adds value to the customer, it's considered waste. So that includes things like bugs in the software or even like managerial tasks. Those are like, oh, no, those don't add any value to the customer at all. 
we don't need to, we, we want to cut out as much of that as possible. And then also I have uh, the Big Bang, which is the most inefficient way you could ever go about anything. There's no real management style. There's no real like development life cycle for it. It's just, you are working on a thing to release. No real, um... oh, somebody said confluence is down. Oh. What's down? Confluence. Awesome. Um, gosh, uh, just been... to back up just a little bit, because I, Jennifer, I come from different, you know, background. She's been doing this a lot longer than I have. So sometimes I think we have a good balance because I end up going, okay, well, you know, I haven't been in this that long. There's probably a lot of people here who have not been doing this very long or just interested in it. So just to confirm what the software development life cycle is, just so everyone understands what all these frameworks are. It's just a process used for structuring um, the development of any software system uh, from you know, the initiation of it to the deployment, the maintenance, like from beginning to end. So these are just different frameworks that different places use to go through that process and hopefully keep security in mind during that, but we will see. Yes. And, you know, there's also uh, a couple of other ones that aren't listed here that are really important. So we still kind of want to call some attention to there's the DevOps and DevSecOps, um, which aren't necessarily the software development, a software development lifecycle in each other, but more of a principle that um, the development and operation side of things should be interconnected in some way to improve the deployment life cycle or development security teams and operation teams should work together to uh, accomplish these tasks to build a better product overall. Um, ah, somebody says, fair to say that Agile is like the hipster of SDLC. Uh, you know what? Perfect. Yes, I would say that. But also I think Agile's in my head, and I don't know if this is true or not, but in my head, it feels like Agile is probably the most widely used one. And there's also a bunch of frameworks inside of Agile itself, like um, Kaban, which I cannot remember off the top of my head right now what its specific things are, but then there's like Scrum, which has the Scrum Master, and everything I've ever seen about a Scrum Master is that even Scrum Masters don't know what they do, um, which has always made me laugh. Uh, so uh, my understanding, uh, and this is somebody who's never been a Scrum Master, so maybe I am wrong. So if there's any Scrum Masters in the audience, please, please correct me. But my idea or my understanding is that they're meant to facilitate the communication and transfer of data between different teams and kind of uh, keep information flowing. I can't help but imagine them being like uh, Tina Turner in, you know, <laughs> two men enter, one man leave, where they're just like throwing everybody into the ring and, you know, seeing who comes out. Uh, somebody said a scrum master is a cat herder. And you know what? That feels very accurate. Um, yep. Yes. Thunderdome. Welcome. <laughs> yeah. I think it was uh, Kathy was comparing it to Thunderdome this morning. Mm -hmm. Somebody just posted. Oh, uh, I did yeah. see uh, somebody ask a question, True. which is absolutely not related at all. But does Kathy cater lunches at Secure Ideas? And the answer is sometimes. <laughs> uh, and let me tell you, she is a wonderful chef. Thank um, you. We have a running uh, reasons why Kevin's a diva list. And one of them was that he hired a personal chef, which is Kathy. But it's hilarious because he's not the one that hired her or even selected her. It was uh, another coworker called Travis Phillips. The, uh, the day I did come in to uh, interview with <laughs> Kevin and Jason, though, I walked into the office and walked into the room we were going to talk in, and there was an emergent circulator with a bunch of steaks in it on the table, mm -hmm. and I was just like, I already love this place. <laughs> it's like, did you guys do that on purpose? And they were like, no, we do this all the time. So all, all good cooks in their own way. So this is a, a little bit of an overview. We're going to use Agile for a lot of this just again, because it's it's such a common uh, SDLC. So general structure of this is requirements. We're going to kind of lay, uh, and I do promise we'll go way more into depth on all of these, but we have the requirements, design and architecture. There's the implementation, which is the SIT, QA, acceptance testing. Then finally, we have uh, deployment, which will then go into the evaluation and 
prioritization and it all kind of like will cycle back around on itself and hopefully we can kind of continuously improve uh, whatever it is that we're working on or developing. Um, and something that I kind of want to call attention to on this slide here, and uh, I will let Kathy, uh, once I kind of explain this, I'm going to ask Kathy if she's ever experienced this and kind of give some insight into it. But one thing that I very commonly see is that it very frequently feels like it's a soft or a security team versus the developer team. I had uh, an engagement very recently where I was working with a company's red team, their internal red team to help them do a pen test. And every time we got something, they're like, yeah, we got them. We got them again. And I'm like, hey, that's not like the best approach. Like we should be working as a team with them. So that way they we, like to improve an organization's overall security, it's better if we can work as a unit rather than against each other. And there's also many times where um, the security team's like, yeah, we're trying to give you access to this, but the development team doesn't want us to touch it. Like they're just on guard with every, like the moment that I come in, uh, developers will very frequently just immediately put their hackles up and they're just ready. Like they're extremely combative from the get go. Uh, disgruntled devs. Yes. Disgruntled devs. Yeah. Somebody said that they like the idea of de DevSec ops, but they've never seen it implemented as a shared responsibility amongst a group. And yes, that is, uh, I think part of it is that a lot of, again, there's that mentality of it's us versus them and not us versus a problem. Uh, and so when we have that us versus them mentality, it's going to be really hard to work in cohesion with each other and kind of find that middle ground. And um, this isn't just a security team issue and it's not just a development team issue. It's I very frequently have seen it so that both sides are just so rigid. Um, but I mean, Kathy, have you had experience with like the developers not? Absolutely. Um, it, it's interesting to see the different, you know, working with different clients and some of them, they really are in that DevSecOps, you know, space and they work together really well and other ones, you know, they, they really do fight amongst themselves um, to the point where we've, you know, I think at, at, for one report, I ended up um, doing a custom uh, strategic guidance about, you know, basically getting along better, like working mm -hmm. together more as a team, um, because it, it, it is an issue, yeah. you know, um, and it, everybody's on the same team. So it's, it's really, it's mm -hmm. hard to understand sometimes, but like, we've got to, you know, sometimes you'll be in there with security and they're like, we just need a, a hammer. Like, can you just please say that this is broken and it needs fixing and, you know, put it in the report because, you know, we, they won't listen to us. Um, so, and, and that's what we need to do sometimes. Yes. Uh, there's many times that, and I know this is, I'm, I'm by five. I'm, I'm short. I'm probably one of the shortest people at security is, and I'm very frequently with clients. I am the person that's brought into meetings to be the muscle. Like I'm here to be the bad guy. So like the security team's like, we need this. And the development team's like, no, you don't need this because of this reason. And my job is to say, you are wrong here are all the ways that you are wrong so I can be the bad guy not the security team um and there have been times that like I've been we do architecture reviews at security is so uh, I've done a few software development life cycle uh reviews with clients so what will happen is we'll sit down we'll talk with every all the different team members at different times and kind of get an idea for how everything goes and then uh we'll kind of write up like hey here are the things that you guys are doing good here are the things that you can improve on here's the areas where you can implement some more security checks uh but there have been times that i've been in those meetings where the security team and the developer like the product team started screaming at each other so much that like I took my headphones off and set it down and I could still hear like they were just like it was like a knockout drag down fight and the management that was on the team didn't do anything to step in and kind of corral it and uh, I was having a hard time getting them on track so that I made the decision I was like hey why don't we just step away for a little bit I'll meet with you both separately at a later date sorry <laughs> my dog is bothering me so I don't know what he wants but uh, he's being very neat so I'm just gonna Look at the puppy. It's always a good day when puppies show up. Yeah, he's. I'm not sure what he's whining though. He might need to. Somebody asked, "Do you think the security issues in software development can be attributed to payment based on number of characters and lines of code?" Ooh, that's a good question. I don't know many companies that actually 
do that in practice i do know they exist and i can say that that is probably going to be one of the you're going to get the most convoluted and useless code out of that i feel like you're not going to get something that's super efficient and realistically the more convoluted and uh difficult something becomes for no reason the more likely we are to implement or to uh wow i just forgot the word i was looking for uh Invite, I guess I'm going to use the word invite, the more likely we are to kind of have those those security flaws that would otherwise not be present because we're making these things overly complex. Um, somebody said that they don't think that's very common today. I, you're right. I don't think it's super common. I know it still exists in some places, but it's not super common. Um, so for a quick breakdown on the requirements section or what the requirements part really is, um, the, the application team for this, obviously, requirements, we're going to sit down, we're going to look at and say, okay, this is the product we're trying to build. This is what the application is going to be. These are all the things that we're going to need out of it. They have the, the stories that we're working on. But really, what we're going to want to look at here, uh, especially from the security side of things, we should be acting more as like an advisor. Um, the security team kind of really also needs to work with the development team within their structure. It's really easy uh, from an outside security team to be like, no, we, you have to do it our way. It's our way, the highway. But the development team has got their own set of issues that they need to work, worry about. And so I feel like as security, our job would be a lot easier uh, if we weren't uh, needlessly trying to push them to fit our role rather than kind of trying to give them the additional information or additional help that they need. Um, this is also a good chance for the security team themselves to get, and get some visibility into what these, uh, what features might be present or what functionality is there because that can also kind of help them build that roadmap of, okay, well, I can see that, I know that we need to be able to upload PDFs. So here are some security controls. We need to make sure that we are locking down what kind of files can be uploaded. And here are the different ways that we can check to make sure that they're being uploaded. And we can also consider once it's on the back end, how are we gonna make sure that it's not malicious. Um, and also by participating in this, uh, security gets to really put that input of, okay, well, development, what is your, what is, how are you going to handle these uploads? How are you go, what are you going to do with them once they have been uploaded? What checks are going to be taking place? And then um, finally, uh, once we have an idea of everything that's going to be implemented long-term, we can start developing a plan for what to test and when to test it. And the reason why this is important is very frequently we'll have clients come to us and be like, hey, we have this product that's going out. It's launching in three weeks. We need it tested. And we'll be like, hey, do you have any, have, has there been any checks at all? And they're like, well, no, like that's what the pin test is for. Mm -hmm. And yeah, sort of. But the problem is, is that uh, very frequently what's going to happen is we're going to find a large number of issues. Um, and it's, uh, I know uh, I myself have done this. There is a, another employee here at Secure Ideas named John, who has made multiple developers cry. He had one developer just hang up. Um because he just completely ruined this dude's day. There were so many issues with the application um, that they were going to have to push back the release because they didn't have enough time to fix all of the issues before it went live. And so if you implement these smaller security checks along the way and plan these out, then once it gets time to be the pen test, I'm not gonna waste my time looking at out-of-date libraries or weak dependencies or um, those really minor issues. I'm not gonna have to waste time with those. And instead I can focus on the really interesting things, the things that are going to present the biggest threat to you. Um, yeah, Did you have any that there's always a, you know, a push, you know, mm -hmm. software is starting to be developed to, you know, get it out quickly, get it done. And security gets put, you know, by the wayside, unfortunately, sometimes, yes. but then, you know, when it, when it's deployed and we test it and, you know, everything's broken, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, it's, it's no fun for anybody to, to go back and have to redo everything. Exactly. And, um, 
somebody said, uh, stay calm when you talk to the developers, uh, the developers understand their perspectives. That is really, that's very important. That's something that uh, I try to be as patient and empathetic as possible because I understand that my job, I have the easy job. I get to go in, I get to tell them their baby is ugly and then I go home. Uh, but anybody who's had a baby and somebody's like, your baby's ugly, like, that hurts your feelings. Like, and I don't want to hurt their feelings. I want to help them. Um, so. And we understand the pressures, you know, yes. to put those things out quickly and to have, make sure they have all the features that, you know, they're supposed to have and everything's working quickly. And, you know, unfortunately, you know, security goes by the way. So. Yeah. So, and uh, definitely, I think that there needs to, it's, Again, that's not, it's when it comes to developers versus security teams, it's not a one-sided issue. It's not just the developers that are being real finicky. It's it's both sides. So we're really kind of advocating for that, uh, both sides trying to work through this. Um, we have the design and architecture phase. Um, again, ideally the development team will use the security team, ask them questions, kind of treat them as a, uh, again, advisors and things that the security team should be doing during this pay or during the stages. One, they need to be advocating for secure code, coding practices. They're going to say, no, we need to make sure that we're using uh, up to date. Our dependencies aren't going to be vulnerable. The libraries we're using are up to date. They also need to know, and this is going to be different for every company, but like the algorithms, protocols, platforms that are approved by an organization, which ones are actually um going to be compliant with whatever the company is trying to do. And in cases where there's something like PCI or HIPAA or some other compliance or regulatory body involved, which, uh, what items do they really need to be paying attention to and what can help with that? Did you have anything for this page, Kathy? Uh, no, do not right now. I, I mean, let's be honest, the design and architecture phase, uh, especially for security teams is kind of, it's not as fun as some of the other parts. For sure. Um, we've got a question, Jason C. I'm in a new role where I need to make sure we're doing secure coding, but also security of embedded systems and vehicles. Is there any good resources to read up on to learn more? What skill set do you need? Um, so there is a there's a book. It's like the Car Hacker's Handbook or something. I read this a while ago. Um, I like that one a lot. But I actually know somebody who's in the automotive industry who does. Um, what is it? Uh, they do that. So if you, I'm going to go ahead and share my email in the, the chat. Real quick, if you shoot me a real quick email, I'll reach out to my contact and see if they have anything that they recommend for you. Um, but I've, I've actually been, uh, this is somebody that I've been uh, pretty good friends with for a little while now, and that's what she does. So I'm sure she'll have way better input than me for that. Um, so we have the SIT, QA, and acceptance. And uh, something that uh, our CEO, Kevin Johnson, has said very frequently, and he's not wrong on this, is uh, pen testers are glorified QA. We really kind of are. Um, we're not, we're QA on steroids. We'll be doing a lot of the same tasks that your QA team will be doing themselves, but I'm also going to be going above and beyond that because QA is like, okay, well, how is the application going to behave if I do this? And I'm like, okay, so if I do this, the application responds this way, can I leverage that to exploit something I shouldn't be able to do? So we're, we're just that one step beyond. Um, and that's also why we very firmly say anybody can do what we do because it's really just kind of trying to build that understanding of an application and then uh, work work through it and kind of find make it behave in ways that it was not intended to behave in. All of all of pen testing is identifying context and then trying to break out of that context. Um, so let's see. I just want to make sure that I've uh, I've covered everything. Kathy, do you have anything to add for this? Because we are going to go over a little bit about DAST and SAS tooling um, as well. Yeah, I think we're on to that. Okay. And um, again, every stage in the software development lifecycle that is a, every time that there is a chance for QA, there is a chance for security testing. Um, one of the things that we 
very heavily recommend is that during any of this, there's linting, which goes through checks for any obvious code errors, go through and do dependency checks. I will always advocate for dependency checks because uh, Kathy could probably confirm this, but I think the most common finding I have on a report is outdated JavaScript libraries. It's on um, every yeah, it's almost every report. Almost. And that, yes. that might not seem like it's, oh, it's just an outdated JavaScript library. But we had very recently, it's like, okay, well, they had uh, Moment.js that was just slightly out of date. But there was this one issue with it that ended up turning into a stored cross site script attack that affected everybody. Like, because this happens, we try to be aware of what we're testing. Um, and we try not to have impact other users, but the way that this particular application, what was initially thought to be just a reflected cross-site script attack turned out to be stored and it affect, affected everybody who got an email from this product. Uh, so that very minorly outdated moment JS turned into a system-wide issue. There have been a, a lot of, um, the web app tests for me, a lot of Cross-site yeah. scripting vulnerabilities in the outdated JavaScript libraries mm -hmm. the last few months. There, there's been a lot. So, what seems like a minor detail turned into a very bad one. Um, somebody said that they have so many dependencies that it's hard to manage. That is that is unfortunately true. An application that I tested not too long ago, the amount of dependencies in it were insane. Uh, building out a good vuln management system is, it's hard, but this is also why we advocate very heavily for doing these vulnerability assessments, doing uh, security checks in during the development life cycle, because when you get to the end of it, it significantly shortens the amount of testing that is needed, and it significantly improves the quality of tests that you're going to get. Um, so even before you get a full pen test, I will always recommend doing your own vulnerability assessment uh, using uh, something. We use Nessus, but there's other like open source tools that are free, like Nikto, um, Nexpo, which I do not believe is free, but I don't know the price. Uh, but whatever tooling your company has, um, always run this first. And they, yeah, they have a high level of false positives, but what they're going to do is they're, they look for patterns or these indicators that something's there. And if you're going to get back a whole bunch of outdated libraries, that's an area where you can try to uh, provide fixes prior to pen testing. Um, it's really kind of good for weeding out the low hanging fruit. And there's also, again, with dependencies, there's also the difficulty of sometimes you can't really update a dependency for some reason because maybe they stop supporting it and everything else is built off of this. You, in those cases, one, we, we're really going to try and push you to pick something different or try to rebuild it in a more secure way, but look at ways that you can implement additional security controls around it. How strictly is your WAP going to work to prevent me from accessing URLs I shouldn't be accessing, um, et cetera. Uh, do you have anything, Kathy? No, I think you covered that. Awesome. And so we're going to move into some SAST versus DAS tooling. Oh, hello. Oh, somebody has a question. I see tons of focus on traditional code with SDLC, SAS, DAS, uh, focused on product development. What about infra as code, YAML, and the kind of code that doesn't really sit with the product development team? I feel lacking in guidance. Okay, that is, mm, yeah, I can see what you're talking about because there's there's a lot of like, uh, there's a lot of pieces of things that, like like puzzle pieces. There's a lot of puzzle pieces that are going, that are unfortunately, you're right, those are lacking. That's a really good point. Um, I'm gonna have to, I'm gonna have to look into that. That might be a good topic for a future date, um, but that is a, that is a really good question. So, um, so we we've listed just a couple of SAS versus DAS tooling here. The real um, the real difference for those of you who don't know, there's the static analysis and the dynamic uh, application. It's static application security testing and dynamic application security testing. And this is something that uh, my background in reverse engineering malware actually 
uniquely prepared me for because there's there's two main ways of analyzing malware. There's the static analysis where I'm going to put whatever it is into either a debugger or a decompiler, and I'm going to go through it and look at it statically to figure out what it's doing. And then there's the dynamic analysis where I'm going to execute the sample and then watch what it does. And dynamic is usually always going to be the fastest way to do it. Uh, but I will always advocate for the hybrid approach for these types of things. And the hybrid approach is where you're going to be using dynamic testing uh, and static testing procedures, because that's going to really give you the best of both wor worlds and give you a more complete picture. Um, so we have, uh, we, we had to be very careful with some of the, the products that we were listing here because we don't really want to say, uh, there are some SaaS tools out there that are really well known that we will never use as security is. And we're not going to name them because I do not wish to disparage a company publicly that I do not know, but I know the product. I don't like the product. Um, so we were, we were kind of careful with some of these. So please do not, these are not an end all be all. There's a ton of products out there. Um, Kathy, do you have that link? I had a SAS link for OWASP. I want to go yes. ahead and share that in the chat. So Kathy's going to post yeah, a I'll link in the Discord for SAS tools. OWASP has a list of different SAS tools that you can use and the different things that they do. I highly recommend going through that if you need to find some some type of SAS tooling. Go through that and figure out what's going to work for you. Uh, I just I don't want to uh, accidentally advocate for a product that I would never use. So. Um, I'll post that. Somebody says I'm not up to date, but the DOD, I believe, is now requiring anyone supplying software to sign off that it is secure. Um, I am very curious what it takes to be considered secure by the DOD because, you know, there's like the, oh, it's a, uh, what is it? It's like military grade something. And it just means that, like, oh, this is a military grade ashtray. It just means that it won't. It, it only breaks into so many parts if it breaks. Um, so let's see. So the uh, somebody asked about RASP, which I do believe is the is that's the runtime, right? Runtime application. Um, I'm totally just spacing on that. Acronyms are hard, and we are in a field with a ton of acronyms. Um, but we do have GitLab and GitHub listed here just because they are very widely used. Every company that I've ever interacted with that used these for their SaaS has loved it. Uh, I cannot state price-wise how they are. I'm not the one to ask about that, but uh, I personally don't have any real complaints about those. Um, and then we also have for dynamic application security testing. We've listed Burp Suite and Zap just because what's going to happen is we're going to be using the application as it's intended to be using while proxying all of our traffic through Zap. Um, something that's not listed here but falls very well into both of these categories is Mob SF. So for those of you who ever, if your company develops uh, mobile applications in any way, something that you need to be utilizing. It, it's called MobSF. It's the mobile security framework. And it will, all you have to do is, it lets, I'm going to use Android as an example. You can upload the APK and it'll do static checks. And then you can set up either a VM or uh, use a physical device and then do a runtime analysis. So it'll hook into the process. You'll use the mobile app as it's intended to be used. And MobSF will then tell you the issues that it finds along the way. If you're if you're making mobile applications and you're not utilizing this in some way, you really need to significantly reconsider your process. Um, it is, uh, I use it on every mobile application test I, I do. And I will also say, uh, interestingly enough, for those of you who don't know, uh, Doing a dynamic analysis with an Android environment is significantly harder than doing a dynamic analysis for uh, an Apple environment whenever it comes to mobile applications. And a lot of that has to come down to certificates. Uh, Apple will just let me trust a certificate and let MobSF hook the process, no problem. Burp, it'll take burp, no problem. Android it does not want to let you do that, which I've always thought was very interesting. Yeah, which seems kind of like counterintuitive, or, right? Yeah, to what you usually expect, or at least I expect from Android and from, from Apple. 
So let me go ahead and real quick, I'll share a link for MobSF to their GitHub. Oh yeah, pen certs. And there's there's way to get around pen certs if you're going to be doing any type of testing uh, for uh, mobile applications. Definitely make sure that the certificate, you, cert you want certificate pinning turned off. Um, it is best practice to have it there and it is secure, And but it we don't want to test to make sure that works. We want to test if somebody is able to bypass that some way or another, how are they going to, what could they accomplish? So that's just generally why we try to advocate for that. Um, but realistically, uh, security is a full stack responsibility. We have just a very quick overview of some of the different things here that each of the different, uh, let's see, teams, I say teams, but you know, we have anybody that's working on the database or dealing with the database that's underlying the application. These are the steps they can take or people who are, in response, who are responsible for maintaining the application server that the application's running off of. Here are some of the things that they can do. And then we also have, what are the client side application? What kind of controls can be put in there? It's, it shouldn't just be, okay, we've built this whole thing and then we will now, um, we'll test it and it'll be secure. And somebody said, I'm surprised and sad. I missed whatever that was. But um, the reason why we stress this as much as possible and why there should be uh, as many security checks as you can integrate security into the development life cycle as much as possible, because there are many times where we will encounter applications where the security team was not involved in building it at all. And these tend to be quite honestly, the most fun test for me to do because I'll find a bunch of really fun uh, vulnerabilities in it, such as hard coded credentials in a JavaScript on a publicly facing web app. Yes, that has happened several times. Um, but we're gonna talk about a specific case study uh, for something called the Therac 25. And this is a case where security was not implemented at any part during the development lifecycle of a software used for a radiation device, uh, for radiation therapy. Um, um, granted, this was back in the 80s. So yes. a few years ago. Um, <laughs> but this is, I mean, as far as I know, probably one of the most horrific mm -hmm. cases of insecure coding resulting in something awful how would somebody update at the rack uh probably just buy a whole new one um yeah just build another one yep so there was there was actually a lot of issues with this um i'll go ahead and let kathy take over for this part though cool um so yes this was a radiation machine um that was controlled by a uh, computer program and it it was used a lot and used terribly towards the end. So um, <laughs> this is a picture of it, but you know, if we move on, Jennifer, you want to go to the next slide. Yeah, I'm controlling the slide. So she's going to have to know when she's ready. <laughs> <laughs> so we had uh, six incidents. Um, here we've got a uh, screenshot of what the uh, interface would have looked like back then. Um, and the, the code has never been released for this to the public um, since everything happened. So uh, we've got some examples a little bit later of what uh, what we think it might have looked like, um, but it was caused by race conditions uh, that caused the machine to administer lethal doses of radiation. Um, this led to fatalities and serious injuries and um, it, the, the company We'll, we'll get into that a little bit further if you want to move to the, the next slide. I know we're getting low on time. So uh, this was, I think, the first one, July of 1985. Maybe not the first one, but a patient received a massive overdose due to an error message, which should have been the first indication that something was wrong, right? Um, yes. You want to move to the next one? Um, and I'm just going to add in real quick. Yeah. Part of, because you were talking about there was a race condition with it. So what would happen is if you would input incorrect, there was two different ways that it could deliver radiation. And if you input the method wrong, it was meant to immediately shut down and say, hey, that's not correct. You need to fix it. But they, the whoever was responsible for inputting the measurements couldn't just go in and fix it, but they found out that if they hit like the keys in the right order, it would allow them to go in and edit it. But 
a problem with this is that if they use that method, it would turn off that check. So they were no longer checking to make sure no uh, excessive amounts of radiation was being performed. So it was, yeah, a combination of uh, software bugs, inadequate safety design, poor human interfaces. You know, you said that there was a whole like, bunch of things that were not considered during the development process that kind of contributed to this. Yes. And, you know, this is what what's scary to me, like beyond the obvious, is that, you know, this is one that ended in, you know, horrible circumstances. How much other code is still out there or that we don't know that has been running things and things have been happening and they haven't attributed to that yet? You know, there's still a lot of this stuff out there, unfortunately. Um, so what we've got here is, like I said, the source code's never been publicly released, um, but this snippet represents a simplified version of the logic. And as Jennifer mentioned, the race condition allowed the machine to fire a concentrated X-ray beam um, when it should have been a normal operation. And this, I don't remember if we put the any of the specifics into I don't the think we slides. have um, the, are you talking about each of the instances that happened? Yeah. Yeah, yeah I don't think we really broke it down uh, by the, the incidents um, that are if happening. I remember correctly, there were like six deaths. Yeah, months. six people ended up dying as a result and then other people developed more cancer as a result and then other people like ended up like losing limbs because of the severe radiation burns that they ended up receiving as a part of it yeah. um it is uh quite unfortunate because the people that were being that were using that these machines were being used on were people who were heavy who had cancer and they needed the radiation therapy and if i remember one of the first ones that happened was somebody that had brain cancer uh so they received a very lethal dose of radiation directly to their brain. Uh, they they only live for a few more days, if I'm remembering correctly. And it was huge doses of of rad that you know would have been. I think so. Uh, somebody was saying that the race condition, and that is it's it's being run across cores uh, slash etc. So uh, one thing we want to point out: this is what. This, they say this is an, a sample because like Kathy was saying that this code has never been fully released. So it's very hard for us uh, to find exactly where all of these race conditions could have occurred that would contribute to this happening just because there was no transparency, which is very unfortunate uh, because if they had been transparent, further issues uh, for other software could probably be avoided. Yep, somebody said pretty much it was cooking people like being in a microwave. You were correct. Absolutely. Um, and then, you know, the manufacturer response to this was not what we like to see. Um, they denied that the machine could have caused the radiation burns and overdoses experienced by patients. I'm not sure what they, you know, what they attributed it to then, you know, if it, they were, I don't know if they were blaming it on user error what it was, but uh, they refused to believe that the incidents were linked to that machine. Well, I think they um, also kind of got away with it because they're like, well, these people had cancer. They were already dying. Like, it's not our fault that they died. Yeah, uh, they were already dying. So, which was, again, unfortunate. And they did make design changes, but I, I think part of it was based on the um, them being required to do so. Mm -hmm. uh, if we so, yes, the investigations by the FDA um, declared it defective yep. and ma they mandated that they submit a corrective action plan, which included over 20 changes to the system hardware and software to enhance safety measures. So, yes, um, they, they ended up having to uh, implement a lot. Uh, uh, like I said, it, it was saying, hey, you need to do over 20 changes, but uh, also, this is, uh, while we're, we're talking about this, like this is a worst case scenario. Obviously, most of us are not going to be working on software that <laughs> controls how much radiation somebody gets. But, um, oh, I love that. Somebody said, patient was presented with the uh, EULA. It's not our fault. I like that. <laughs> um, so 
Well, most of us will never be using a radiation machine or not using a radiation machine. None of us will ever be developing the software for a radiation machine. Uh, so this is a worst case scenario. We, yeah. we do want to highlight it because um, they're, when, especially in hospitals, one of the reasons why uh, we still see Windows XP very regularly. And anytime somebody's like, oh, I saw XP on a pen test. I'm like, were you testing a hospital? Part of the issue is that for a very long time, like up until very recently, and this is still very much the practice, um, you couldn't just update the software on something. Uh, so, and a lot of the, the, code that's being run on say like an MRI machine is reliant on the software for the computer that it interacts with being a certain version. The manufacturers of those MRI machines aren't going to upgrade it so that it'll work with Windows 11. So you have to keep it at Windows XP because your options are either never upgrade that computer or buy a whole new MRI machine. Um, and that is very expensive. Yeah, somebody said more holes than Swiss cheese. And uh, anybody who's heard me talk, the Swiss cheese model of error, uh, I did one not too long ago about oil circuits and cheese, about how uh, an oil rig ended up going down and talk very heavily about the Swiss cheese model of error. I highly recommend checking that out because security very much is like Swiss cheese. Uh, did you have anything else, Kathy? Sorry. Uh, no, just to say that, like you said, this is a, a worst case scenario, obviously, and something that happened a long time ago, but um, I don't think this is, you know, it's impossible for something like this to happen again, obviously, yeah. probably not with, you know, this same type of machine, but, you know, there's there's code in the grid and like all kinds of like other... SCADA devices. Yeah. Um, yeah anything a, a for... lot of older stuff yeah. in those because, you know, they're supposed to be segmented and air gapped and you know we know they they always are i've always heard that if you want to print money learn COBOL. <laughs> <laughs> um to close this part of it out uh yes they did get sued of course yes. you know if there was any question to that and the lawsuits were settled up so we so don't know exactly what happened uh or what was settled and you know, I can guarantee that if it were today, <laughs> it would be good probably job. a lot more publicity. They probably would have been, I, I hopefully be forced to share the code. Um, it, I think one of the biggest tragedies uh, on behalf of the company that was responsible for this is that they have safeguarded that code so that nobody can really understand exactly what happened here. We just know small parts little bits and pieces of it um but this is it's a really interesting case study and i do recommend um there's a couple of videos on youtube uh, i think plainly difficult has some um, about this if you want to learn more about it and like the actual impact from it i do highly recommend looking into that obviously we couldn't go as deep into it today because uh well our main focus was the software development life cycle yeah, I would look more into it. It's pretty interesting, but the, you know, there's not, there's so much out there about, you know, more modern day things now uh, and, and not as nearly as much as you would think there, mm -hmm. there should be on this because of how tragic it was, but you know, 82 settled out of court. Yep. So, yeah, I know that we said that six people ended up dying as a result, but there was realistically, uh, I think a few hundred people that were affected by it overall. Um, and I apologize if anybody can hear that in the background, but <laughs> my yard guys this time of year in Florida only come once a month, but they make sure to come if I am in a meeting or any kind of webcast. They're here. Oh yeah, always. Um, certain. And so finally we have questions. This is a, uh, this is a picture taken at the office during our last, like the last time that we had headshots taken. Uh, Kathy just so happens to have, you know, being a horror fan has these masks in her desk. Yeah, this um, was during the during yeah. All Hands last summer. Yeah, it was. Yeah. Oh, so, I also see that I have like Silent Hill. I have some, I don't know if you can see them really, but over here I have Silent Hill pictures. Um, so there's one in the background there. Oh, and a little Mothman. Uh, I love Mothman. I don't know if anybody's noticed. I have a lot of Mothman stuff behind me. So does anybody have any questions? I know, I know that after this, we'll move into, I think it's like a breakout session so we can talk a little bit more about like upcoming training and stuff like that, but.
as soon as I figure out how to stop sharing my screen. Uh, Zoom likes to always move stuff around. Yes, that is true. Correct, for sure. Hey, Jennifer. Well, well, hey, Hello. Well, Hi. Hey. It's a great, I don't know how you do Discord and this at the same time. It's just, it's very impressive. Yeah, I good, know. Yeah, good job. Yeah, good, good job, job responding to the questions mm -hmm. while it's happening. Yes, uh, we were commenting in the backstage that you're still, you still our jobs. Yeah. I know. I was really excited because that was my job to watch yeah. for the questions. We were excited. And then that way, Megan could talk about how when she was younger, she had like a party line. Uh, oh, I phone. did not have a party Oh, I remember line. Party I, did, I did charge long distance calls to my neighbor's phone number. I got Ooh, caught. So like, she got away with it. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, thank you, everybody. Uh, <clears throat> let's do a wrap up. And then we'll ask if there's any additional questions. So that way, if anyone needs to leave at the top of the hour, we make sure that happens. So Jennifer, I'm going to ask you, and Kathy, I'm going to ask you the same question. Jennifer, if you were to sum up everything that you just said in one final takeaway, what would it be? Look for ways to implement security into every step of your uh, software development lifecycle. It doesn't have to be a full pen test, but small checks along the way. All right. Kathy, same question to you. That's valid, but um, work together for sure. The, yeah. You know, security is everyone's responsibility. That it's, you know, shouldn't be an us against them mentality. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I heard the other day that security always says no. Like that's the like, mm -hmm. no, you can't. Tell. The... No, no. <laughs> yeah. Um, but for the most part, it's like, if that's what you want to do, let's figure out a way to do it. Yeah. Of, yeah. Yeah. All right. So if you are joining us and you want to talk about actual training for you, or if you have questions about training, we have a breakout room. And so if you take a look at your Zoom interface, there should be something that says breakout room. If you click that, you can go join the breakout room. Brian and Kyle oh, will be is. in there. And so you can join. I think Jennifer and Kathy are going to join the breakout room too. So if you have yes. questions about training and classes, feel free to hop in there. If you ever have any questions at all, like customer service related, that is what Megan is here for. <laughs> uh, if you join us in Discord today, thank you so much. The conversation will keep going in Discord. Uh, so the webcast or the anti-cast is for an hour, but Discord is for forever. And so that's a great place to stick around and help answer each other's questions. All right. So, I, you know, I'm going to take a look here and see if there's any other like major questions. I threw those. I threw, I threw a few in the. All right. Go ahead, Brian. Go ahead. I'm going to jump to the, the, the breakout room. Well, we'll ask a question first and then go. No. Okay. Oh, you want me to ask a question? Okay. <laughs> you want me to ask a question? Um, I'm currently a beginner in QA testing. I have no experience. Do you think QA testing will be the roadmap as a beginner to pen testing? Uh, that's a that's a good uh, question. One, it's kind of, <laughs> yeah. We were actually talking about the roadmap that we took into security this morning and how a lot of us just kind of um, completely deviated from what we thought our roadmap was going to be. I think that is a valid path. Okay. But it's going to very heavily depend on the company that you're at like what like sort of lateral movement you can have from there or again if you're able to develop that understanding and build connections with people outside uh to show that yes i can do qa but then i can also go a little bit further so Ooh. developing that understanding is very important i think it's a valid path Oh, well, Jason, the rest of the questions that I had are in the, the questions anti-cast chat. So if you can ask those and I'm going to jump over because there's already 11 people in the AMA. Oh, so yeah. Yeah. So head on over to the breakout room if you have questions about training or your own roadmap to training or certifications or anything that you want to talk about related to training and building skills. Uh, can you let's see what is this is. Is it a way we can view our equipment to verify if we have these codes on our systems currently? So the the code that's uh, I'm going to assume that whoever this is was in a in a healthcare environment. Mm -hmm. uh, realistically speaking, if you're not using a Thrac 25, probably not. Um, this is a little bit older, but this is also one of those. Um, <sighs> Again, it's so hard to say, yeah, no, make sure everything's updated because for hospitals, very frequently, this is buying a whole new radiation device or a whole new MRI. It's not going to be as easy as that. Um, but I very heavily, if you're using a, a supplier for whatever this device is, push for them to have some type of security testing done. Um, if it's something that you are implementing yourself as a company, do that uh do the security testing but also if you're developing 
a medical device or any type of physical device as well, along with the software, consider looking into having the hardware tested as well, because sometimes hardware is going to open you up to a lot more uh, vulnerabilities than you might be expecting. I am not the hardware expert at Security Is. We have Travis Phillips for that. He is, I, I, the things he can do with hardware are insane. Um, Jason, I don't know if you see the questions over in the act in Discord. There was one that says. Which is the best tool, SAST and DAST tools to use escape to to use to escape Burp Suite and Zap? Does that make sense? Uh, <laughs> so besides Zap and Burp Suite. Yeah, I say Oh, like trying to get out uh, to try not to have to use Burp or Zap anymore. Yeah, what is the best tool? That is a good question. Um, I'm not really sure. Uh there was There's not a lot of tooling out there that yeah. is the full alternative to Burp Suite or Zap just because of their functionality. There might be more specific tooling. Like, uh, let's look at it this. Zap and Burp are going to be more of like an overarching solution. I can use Burp to test APIs, web apps, mobile apps. Um, I can use it to test a wide number of things, but it, like, let's say APIs, for example, you might look at using Postman or SOAP UI or, and I cannot remember any of the GraphQL ones, but GraphQL ones exist. Those would be some tooling that you could use to perform testing on those for mobile applications. Again, there's Mob SF, but I, uh, if you have any web applications, something like Fiddler uh, might be good. There's also, uh, oh God, this might, uh, is Web Scarab still a thing? I have not heard of that. I'm looking through the Slack because Corey mentioned something the other day. Um, but of course, there's a lot of lot of chatter in here. So yeah. I'm looking forward. But if I find it, I'll, I'll let you know. But yeah, I don't know if OWASP Web Scarab still exists. Uh, it's, it's a little bit of an older tool. Oh, God. Yeah. No, sorry. It's uh, the initial version was 22 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> I think the last update was four years what? ago, so let's not use that. I know. Might make give away a little bit of how long I've been doing this. <laughs> there was a party line that we could yeah. talk to on the phone. You could, you could do a, a collect. It's so call. weird. What is it? The, I thought the eighties were like twenty years ago. What? what? Wait, what? Okay, oh, Kaido. Like, Somebody called, mentioned Kaido. Kaido. I read about yeah. that recently. Yeah. Yes. Kaido. Dot. Yeah. I will post that in the discord if anybody wants to check it out now i haven't vetted this but it is something to take a look at yes all right so we're gonna wrap up if you want to join the breakout session feel free to do so next wednesday there is no anti-cast because it is a five hour summit and so join us for mm -hmm. the most offensive con that ever offensed where we will have uh, speaker after speaker after speaker after speaker. I will get to host along with Zach uh, and along with many of the people that you recognize here. And so we'll be able to spend a couple hours with you next week. It'll be here on the Anti-Siphon Discord server. So you'll be able to converse with each other while the, the summit is happening. And thank you so much for choosing to spend an hour with us or more if you were here for pre-show banter. Jennifer, thank you. Kathy, thank you so much. Thank you for sharing your knowledge with the community. And if you are watching this and you're ever thinking to yourself, I would like to do that. I would like to share my knowledge. I'd like to do an anti-cast. Well, step one is to submit a talk for Wallace Hacking Fest. Like that is one of the best ways for us to meet you and for us to get to know you and see you on stage. And that way you can present your information. And then after that, we're like, hey there, uh, would you like to present again? And would you like to potentially put a class together? Would you like to do this? And so I would say the first place to get started is to to submit to the CFPs for the summits for Wildwest Hacking Fest, because that's a great for, way for us to, uh, for you to introduce yourself to us and for us to get to know you. All and right. The Wild West Hacking Fest a CFP should be open soon. Just very yes. soon. Yeah. So I've been keeping, watching that like a hawk. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So let's head over to the breakout session. Ryan, okay. do that thing that you do. I don't remember. I don't, I don't know what you do. Do um, we just go backstage and you know, I don't think know. You click on breakout room? Yeah. Breakout room. Yeah. But, but I'm going back to you all go to the breakout room. Yeah. Ryan's going to do something here. And we'll I've got a client call, so I'm going to draw. Yeah. Okay. All right. <laughs> See you, Kathy. Thank you.